Great. Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, February 9th, and we are going to be continuing our testimony on H-133. We have a number of uh, witnesses today. Uh, we started last week, but we're unable to complete the testimony. Um, I do want to note that we, the testimony today, we are still looking at the bill as introduced. Um, last week we did hear um, a witness discuss uh, proposed language and you may, we may in fact hear that again today. Um, however, there is not, there is not an amendment um, as of yet. Uh, and so we are talking about the bill as introduced and want to make sure we get through our, our testimony, the first round of testimony again, um, regarding the bill I've introduced. So with that, I will uh, welcome Eric Davis. Good to see you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Eric Davis. I'm the president of Gun Owners of Vermont. We are an all volunteer nonprofit advocacy group dedicated to uh, the preservation of the right to keep and bear arms. Um, I appreciate the committee to having us in here today and uh, giving us a chance to speak on H-133. Um, it's our understanding this bill was drafted to, to uh, in an attempt to clarify a, a longstanding assumption in existing law that the court has the discretion to remove firearms from a person subject to a relief from abuse order. Um, and at first glance, this seemed uh, pretty straightforward, and I was kind of looking forward to uh, uh, an easy day here with not much to say, but the, the more we, we dig into it and, um, you know, after the, the hearing last week and, and hearing some of the testimony then, you know, we've, uh, we've had some, some things that have caught our attention. So um, I, I'd like to uh, read from my testimony that I prepared from last week and I have some uh, updated notes that I've submitted to the committee as well and I'll kind of uh, ad lib those in there um, as we go. So um, our first and most immediate concern with H-133 is the last line of the bill where we see that it seeks to not only confiscate firearms from the defendant, but also, quote, to uh, those that another person possesses or controls on behalf of the defendant. Um, and there was a, a little bit of discussion on that last week. Um, Current Vermont law allows firearms to be stored by a person accepting legal responsibility for their safekeeping on behalf of persons subject to a relief from abuse order. And that statute is 20 VSA 2307, which I have linked in uh, both of my testimonies, which deals with firearms relinquished pursuant to relief from abuse orders, storage fees and returns. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I won't go through and, and read everything word for word. Um, you know, you, you guys can, uh, you can do that if you wish. Um, but just basically skimming here, uh, 20 VSA 2307 um, allows that a person relinquish firearms, ammunition, or other weapons to a person other than cooperating law enforcement or a third party, you know, a friend or a family member or something like that. Um, and it specifically states, unless the court finds that relinquishment to another person will not adequately protect the victim. So, you know, if, if they were, you know, giving them to somebody that was untrustworthy, for instance. Um, it also states the requirements for that person that is holding the firearms and it states the uh, penalties um, for violation of, uh, of, you know, not holding those um, or giving them back to the defendant or something like that. So that's, uh, that's covered extensively in 23 in 20 VSA 2307. Um, to ad lib a little bit here, there was um, some discussion last hearing on uh, the, the procedure for taking and storing and um, things of that nature. And uh, I, I'd like to go into that a little bit. Um, if, uh, if the law states if the guns are not stored with a third party, like a family member or a uh, or a um, you know a friend or something, if they are taken by an FFL or a police officer, um, there are a couple provisions in there we'd like to point out. Um, the first one is that it states a law enforcement agency that stores firearms, ammunition, or weapons pursuant to subdivision B1 of this section may charge the owner a reasonable storage fee not to exceed $200 for the first firearm or weapon and $50 for each additional firearm or weapon up to 15 months um, and $50 per firearm per year thereafter. There's also a per pound um, fee schedule for the storage of ammunition too. 
Um, so, you know, just to answer some of the questions that came up last time, th this obviously has uh, some serious implications for anyone that's subject to having their property confiscated, but um, especially folks with a large number of firearms or even folks who have a small number of firearms that may not have a very high uh, retail value, um, that might have more of a, a sentimental value. Um, so, you know, under this law, someone who owns some old rifles passed down could, you know, conceivably find themselves in a position where they're forced to pay several times um, what the gun is worth to get it back um, from the folks who are storing it after the legal issues are resolved. Um, it further goes on to state that if the owner fails to retrieve the firearm ammunition or weapon and pay the applicable storage fee within 90 days, um, the firearm ammunition or weapon may be sold at a fair market value. So um, if they can't pay, then their guns can be sold. Um, so we think that's, you know, important to point that out. And, and lastly, to address one question that I know came up specifically about, um, you know, what, what happens if they get damaged uh, in storage or something like that in subsection H, um, you know, gives uh, law enforcement or whoever's storing them immunity from any sort of liability from damages or uh, deterioration or anything like that. Um, th there is uh, a caveat in there for negligence, but, um, you know, other than that, there's, there's not really a whole lot of uh, recourse for somebody to recoup um, any sort of losses if their guns get damaged in storage. So, um, to, to briefly recap, someone who's had their firearms confiscated as a condition of an RFA, they first have to pay the state to reclaim their property and thus their constitutional rights. Um, you know, if they want their guns back, that's their right to have them and they have to pay to get them back. Um, if they can't pay, they lose their property and their rights permanently. And if they can't afford to pay and are willing to do so, what they get back might be in much worse condition than what was originally taken from them. But, you know, anyhow, get circling back to the point here, um, you know, we, we think that if existing law on relinquishing firearms already details the restrictions on third party storage, we believe the last line of H-133 is redundant and unnecessary and potentially creates new and conflicting processes. Um, we have concern that such a provision might be interpreted and even exploited in some cases to take firearms from people who had nothing to do with the incident or the abuse in question. And if you remember, that's already um, that's already happened to the state. I, I think it was in Middlebury. I can't remember the exact place, but the um, the, the kid that was talking about uh, bringing a gun to school and they actually went and, and took the uncle's guns away from him. So. Um, that, that is a little bit of a, a concern for us when we start, you know, carving out niches to try to, uh, you know, take more guns from more folks who aren't potentially involved. Um, uh, furthermore, you know, moving on from that part, we, we have concerns and we, uh, we share the Federation's concerns about the, um, the issue of the standard of evidence, uh, which is found in 15 VSA 1103. 1104 and 13 VSA 4054, which is Vermont's red flag law, and um, the, that standard of evidence being preponderance. It is our position that in instances where an individual presents significant enough danger to justify the forfeiture of their right to keep and carry a firearm, that that decision be made only by due process and only by the highest evidentiary standard of beyond a reasonable doubt or approximately 90% certainty. We believe that any decision to suspend constitutional rights of any individual should not be taken lightly and rather it should be thoroughly deliberated and scrutinized to the highest degree. Um, to, to sort of uh, give a, a little bit of an anecdote to that, going back to last week's hearing and Judge Grierson's testimony, um, the question was raised to him about the specific method of separating the defendant from the firearms and whether that was, you know, more of relinquishment or outright seizure. And um, I want to quote Judge Grierson here. He said, 
a quote, I would be surprised if any officer ever obtained a warrant because you only get a warrant if there is a crime. Or in other words, if there is evidence of a crime, that's what a search warrant does. So they really wouldn't have a basis to get a search warrant in advance of serving the order and they may or may not have one after. Um, so on that note, and with respect to the court's position, it, it almost seems to us like there's a little bit of a double standard when it comes to upholding Second Amendment rights versus Fourth Amendment rights. And if there's not enough evidence for the court to determine that a person's protections against search and seizure must be lawfully suspended, we have to ask why then is that evidence considered sufficient for the court to order a person to quote unquote voluntarily turn over their guns, which also happened to be protected by an entire other constitutional amendment. Um, you know, so we, we would like to see the committee undertake some, um, you know, some discussion of, of that nature on, you know, the, the standard of evidence, um, you know, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, to upholding constitutional rights. And, and we think that that should be uh, held to the highest standard for, for any constitutional right, not, not just guns. Um, so, you know, generally speaking, we have a little bit broader concerns with the overall approach to the problem, as it were. Um, if we assume that the problem which we purport to address by legislation is ensuring the safety of the victims of domestic violence or violence in general, for that matter, it, it seems to us that the legislature's attempts in recent years at fixing this problem seem narrowly focused and specifically they seem focused on creating ways to take guns from people who have not yet been convicted of a crime. And this is uh, disturbing to us for a few reasons. Um, every time we hear about any sort of incident involving a firearm, the conversation immediately changes to one that regardless of all their circumstances, presumes the gun as the focal point of discussion. We've been conditioned to think that every incident involving a gun and even the mere mention of guns should by default be viewed through the paradigm of gun control. We gun rights advocates have been tricked into arguing from a predetermined position because the conversation presupposes that guns are in themselves a problem and that we should discuss the relative merits of controlling them. Considering this, it's no surprise I can't remember the last conversation that the legislature has had which involves protection of this constitutional right, and rather we always seem to be discussing what further restrictions will be considered this year and what new tools will allow us to keep people safe by circumventing the Constitution. Gun owners are consistently inundated with the presumption of guilt as well as restrictive and confiscatory efforts against all users. We believe that we do a disservice not only to gun owners, but to all of those impacted by violence when we allow the conversation to take place within these parameters. And when we narrowly tailor our focus in this manner, when we approach the problem of violence with the idea that controlling objects will somehow control behavior, we neglect to address the multitude of other contributing factors and thereby lessen our effectiveness. We have to ask the questions, if an individual is such a threat to those around them that they cannot be trusted with a firearm, why would we trust them with any other dangerous devices and why are those not specified by law? Additionally, if a person has been objectively determined to be an immediate danger to those around them, why are they out walking around unsupervised anyway? Does not having a gun suddenly make this person safe? We do not take the issue of violence in our society lightly, and we recognize that there are people who need help and protection from those who seek to do harm. We seek to preserve Article 16 and the Second Amendment specifically because they guarantee protection and deterrence for the average person and not just to those who are physically able to protect themselves or those who can afford to outsource, outsource their personal security. We also realize that the actions of a very few individuals with guns reflect poorly on the vastly larger group of gun owners as a whole and society as a whole for that matter. 
and it specifically brings criticism to those of us who are adamant about retain, retaining our right to keep and bear arms. It's our hope that we might start a conversation about a different approach to the issue of mitigating violence, where we begin to analyze individuals and their actions from more of a psychological and a medical perspective, and not just a judi judicial perspective with a narrow focus on guns. The term fishing for guns has been used a couple of times um, to describe this sort of legislation, and, and we've been repeatedly assured that this is not the case with this bill. However, we're left considering a few unanswered questions in conclusion, and mainly if it is already a broadly accepted and relatively unchallenged assumption that the court has the absolute authority to confiscate firearms from a person, person subject to an RFA, um, you know, if that's long been established, however you feel about that. Um, and furthermore, if the court has expressed repeated concerns over tampering with the existing system, we're curious why this bill gets brought up year after year. And we're a little nervous that there's an underlying purpose in this sort of proposing new legislation that has uh, subtle caveats about taking guns from people not even involved, you know, if it's not for the purpose of uh, fishing or finding more guns to take away from more people, uh, then what exactly does it do? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't want to come in here and, uh, you know, sound like it's, uh, you, you know, we, we oppose um, the idea of keeping folks safe or, you know, providing protection to, to those uh, people that very much need it. You know, we, we understand that that's a reality and that, you know, that that's a function of the court system. Um, but I think at the very least, we would like to see a very, a very high level of scrutiny and deliberation when it comes to the issue of separating people from their constitutional rights. Um, in its current state, we have to oppose this bill um, as we kind of find ourselves with a lot more questions than we have answers. So um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you guys very much for the opportunity to, to speak on this today and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your testimony. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands, but I'll give people, give committee members a little bit of time to unmute themselves or raise I know it. that was a lot. I get, I get kind of long-winded sometimes, I apologize. No, 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 it's fine. It was absolutely fine. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, I guess I'm not, I'm not seeing anybody. All right, well, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, okay, and now we'll turn to uh, Will Moore, or Bill Moore. Okay. okay, am I unmuted? Very well. Yes, you are. Uh, Welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, members. Um, Eric and other guests. I'm going to depart from my submitted testimony, which you'll see on the pages from last week, but uh, I am I am going to focus on a separate but underlying issue. Um, the pre, I don't want to say pretense in a pejorative sense, the pretext for the bill, uh, as Eric, I think, at least partly pointed out, is that um, the current practice uh, in family court with relief from abuse orders is an exercise of judicial discretion. Um, the definition of which I can best explain to people who aren't lawyers is uh, there isn't a statutory provision that prohibits it. And it is an accepted practice under the rules of court procedure with regards to those civil orders. So it has been practiced. Um, um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not intimating that it's incorrect. It's been practiced as part of a judicial discretion that's part of the ethical framework of our family courts and other courts. Uh, and the history of the relief from abuse order statute goes back to, I believe, 1980. And 
So we're talking about a very lengthy period of court practice, uh, changing of evolving standards in the community and obviously, unfortunately, um, evolving conditions of the nature of domestic assaults. Um, unfortunately, not to the better. And so we need to acknowledge that there isn't a statutory and underlying statutory basis for the practice of relinquishment or confiscation of firearms um, at the issuance of these orders. We need to acknowledge that there is no court precedent that has established it as a statutory interpretation that comes from somewhere in the statute. It is acknowledged by the courts as a practice that they have confirmed at the Supreme Court of Vermont's level for a discretionary part of these relief from abuse orders. We need to start from that position. There's no question about it. Judge Gerson explained it. I think I've explained it maybe a little bit more ad nauseum. The problem with that is simple. Um, it's that's no good way to make statute. And in effect, what you're doing is proposing a bill that would enshrine and some would say clarify, but it would enshrine a discretionary practice uh, acknowledged by the courts um, into statute, which would basically say that the courts have already done your work and you're rubber stamping it. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I think it's just a matter of fact. It's not uncommon that the courts have been lively in interpreting um, disputes between the state and individuals and brought about questions that the legislature has either been forced to or asked to answer. I would say the Brigham case is a case in point. The court came to you as a legislature and said, your funding system is unfair. It doesn't comport with the common benefits clause, among others, and you need to fix it. But we're not going to tell you how. We'll give you some great indications as to how that's happened. Now, we have two cases. Um, one was brought up and suggested by uh, Eric um, Fitzpatrick, and I maybe brought it out through um, Judge Grierson. Benson v. Mascari, which was posted, I believe, on your webpage last week. Um, in that case, um, there was some court discussion and also a dissent on how far does this go? How far does the statute allow the court to go? And, in, in, and I believe in this case, if I'm not getting two of them mixed up, yes, it is. Um, they raised the question of whether or not firearms and dangerous weapons was clearly within the statute's realm for relief from abuse order under the low level preponderance of evidence. And they questioned part of it because it was poorly worded and poorly documented on the evidence side. There wasn't a lot of evidence in this case, Benson and Scurry, that the kitchen cutlery that this gentleman used in his work would be a nexus for future violence. And they sent it back to the court. They said, look, we're going to confirm for now your firearms uh, confiscation as part of the order. But we're sending you back to relook at this. And it raises a cloud over where that discretion is defined or not defined. And I would say it points out why the judges are responding to Judge Grierson's polling. He's doing his job well. He's calling out to his judges. Those are his basically his underlying staff, as it were, and saying, you know, what do you think of the conditions of this situation? How do you think this is working? What would help? clarify it so that you can do your job better to serve the victims that this statute is intended to comfort and give relief to. The remedy has been exercised within this broad area of, of discretion. It is not from the statute. This case points out where the court said, hey, we're, we're not particularly comfortable with that part of it. You didn't word it well. And then if you go to Reigns, it's another case, which is from 2008, um, gonna just do a little click in here so I get my citation right. Reigns v. Rogers in 2008. Um, this case uh, does question almost directly um, how far can 
the court go. And it also has um, a dissent in it as well. And I would say that the, the next step for you as legislators would be to read both of those cases and read the dissents. And the reason I'm asking you about this and bringing this all out is I think that Judge Gerson is doing a service to the legislature by telling you how his judges are responding and giving you information about where they see this. And he's given you sort of three broad options. One is what you proposed would ostensibly put in statute what discretion they're already exercising. The second broad concept was if you link it so directly in writing to the affidavit evidence as required in 13 BSA 1101A, I think it is, then you might even almost tie their hands a little bit within that discretion. So that was that sort of offhand proposal about changing the wording. The third concept is if you do nothing, we already have the discretion. I think. I don't think I'm being unfair in characterizing his testimony in that way. That's sort of the picture he painted for you as legislators. The question before you is do nothing or do one of these other things or look harder at this and decide whether there's a better role for legislative action. What I would suggest to you is you need to start, you need to back up and start by reviewing the extreme risk protection order statute how its utilization has been, how effective it's been in the courts, how its utilization has been um, trained into the courts, what the response times are like, especially for the ex parte orders, which by the way, the ex parte orders are basically on preponderance, similar to the proposal you have before you. But the permanent order raises the, um, re the confiscation of firearms from a person or their home to clear and convince them. That was an acknowledgement during the debates on S221, an acknowledgement that there were clear due process and evidentiary standards that we and others, including some on the Senate side, were proposing necessary for the protection of that right and the due process rights of both individuals. Um, nothing I'm proposing or suggesting or any of the thought process that I'm urging you towards is meant to belittle in any way the robust and, and, and seriously accessible relief from abuse order process for the basics. We applaud that. The, uh, the relief from abuse order basics are distance separation of individuals from their, their person and workplace and daily lives, including harassment, and stalking either through public or private or electronic means. Those are serious tools, easily accessible. It's between two individuals or individual and possibly dependent children. It doesn't affect the real bare bones, constitutional pre-existent natural inalienable rights like possession of property or firearms in this case. It doesn't get at that, but it's very effective. We've seen it documented repeatedly, and I think you all have applauded it properly. But by moving in this direction, you will be enshrining a discretionary practice with no basis in law, other than that it's part of discretionary judicial practice that's already applicable and available through the extreme risk protection order process. And any cop worth his salt knows about it. And when they're processing an RFA affidavit or responding to a victim's re uh, request for relief, they can make that overture. They can, in other words, they can almost fill the two forms out at the same time. The affidavits overlap so strongly, they're almost indistinguishable from each other. So what I don't understand is this, why have not you had a serious conversation about the effectiveness of the extreme risk protection order to fill the gap that is ostensibly meant to be addressed by this bill. I think one last thought um, by complicating or layering anything further onto the simplicity and accessibility 
and robust nature, the basic RFA statute, you endanger its simplicity, accessibility, and robustness. Every time you nick away and try to add on to it, you could endanger its ability to work as well as it does now. So with that, I will leave you um, with my submissions um, that I've left. I've also sent a an, an ex, uh, fairly exhaustive uh, research study. It's links in, in important documents on the extreme risk protection order, especially for new members who weren't there during S221. And I want to add from my previous written testimony, I am calling that anything, I believe even the extreme risk protection order during the final hearing should be, uh, the uh, defendant should be eligible for assigned counsel under standard rules of criminal procedure and the, and the standard court um, processes and statutes and even eligible if indigent for paid counsel. So with that, I'll leave you. Um, I would love to answer questions about either ERPO or RFA or our standards as far as how our organization approaches uh, this. And I would, again, I applaud this RFA statute as it's, it's, it's basically an effective and accessible and super robust uh, process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just looking to see if anybody has any questions. I'll give folks a minute to committee members to either get their hands raised or, or jump in. Make sure I don't miss. Okay, great. So I'm not seeing any. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Oh, Go ahead. Tom. <laughs> I raised it last, last second. Thank you. Bill, you had mentioned, uh, again, I, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you had talked about, I, I think you said uh, this bill as written could potentially uh, tie uh, the judiciary's hands. Well, is, I think I was- that, that close to what you said? I'm trying to be fair to Judge Grierson. I hopefully he's listening and he can correct me if I went outside the, the lines of painting. Um, he had indicated that there may be some folks who would just want you to do nothing because the discretion they have is, uh, as, is, is less defined than the bill. So, so not that it would endanger it. Um, their discretion would exist, but it would be uh, painted more narrowly under the affidavit link that you've established in your bill. I would, if he were sitting here and I was having a conversation, I would correct him. In 1101A, and in at least one of the dissents in the cases I cited, it is specifically a nature of that statute is one of the, in fact, one of the dissents says, we are, we are ruling on a statute, a, a rare example of where a statute demands the evidence based on the affidavit be the basis for the civil order. And that is, that is a bit unique. And so the, the case that I was citing sort of indicates that if you de-link that, maybe if you de-link that or, or uh, remove it, um, you're broadening the discretion and maybe heading off a possible appeal. Your bill specifically says, this is, we're gonna have this, it's gonna be linked to 1101. You're basically making a statutory uh, 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 draft of the discretion by keeping that link to the affidavit in 1101 when you offer an order under 1103 or 1104 you may have created inadvertently the basis for an appeal based on the fa underlying facts you could look for appeals based on plain error um, you might be putting the police in a position where their uh, investigatory tactics would have to be a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more robust to make sure that they head off those appeals. So I think Judge Grierson will have to respond to your question further, but I think he was pointing out there's always a potential trap anytime you um, write language into statute that uh, dictates procedure in the courts. Great, thank you. I hope that was helpful. 
Any other committee members? Not seeing, not seeing anybody. Uh, I think Kate Thank is you very going. much. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to go to um, Major um, Ingrid Jonas now. Um, Judge Grishin has testified before, so I, I do want to get to um, two witnesses who have not had the opportunity to testify yet, and then we'll go back to two other folks if they if they'd like to testify. So good afternoon and welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. I believe this is the first time I've testified on this. Um, for the record, Major Ingrid Jonas with the Vermont State Police. Vermont State Police is one of five um, entities under the Department of Public Safety. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this discussion on what I see as a fairly simple uh, bill. Um, and we see it as part of promoting safety for survivors of violent crime. <clears throat> I'm gonna be pretty succinct, because as I said, I, I feel this is pretty straightforward. From my understanding, the bill is attempting to clarify or codify what is already occurring. That is that the court has the authority to order firearms to be relinquished in certain cases, such as emergency relief from abuse hearings. Um, we support the powers of the court to promote safety in this manner, and we will continue to serve and enforce orders as partners in that effort um, to promote public safety. We're already doing this work, and meaning we frequently serve and enforce court orders as a fundamental part of the mission of the department. I'm happy to answer clarifying questions or delve into other areas of discussion, but I just wanna be clear that that is our position. We see this as just a simple bill meant to clarify something that's already occurring and we're partners in the effort to promote safety. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. I, let me just see if any committee members have questions on the bill itself and then I, I will move to, a, to another topic that's come up. Uh, Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, I was wondering if you could please address storage. Um, a number of witnesses have expressed concerns about um, firearm storage and um, have expressed concerns that, that this bill could uh, result in, in the need for more storage and that, um, that that's an issue and, and potentially a reason why not to move forward with this, with this bill. So if you could update us on this, the status of storage and, and whether or not that pertains to, um, to this bill and if so, how. So thank you. Okay. Um, so I would say that storage of firearms uh, taken for safety or for evidence um, should not be an obstacle to providing relief for victims. So I see them as separate issues. I just wanna make that clear. Um, we're talking about separate issues here. So um, I think depending on where, which department you work in there, um, certainly storage is an issue and it's something that we should tackle. Um, we should have a long-term plan for storage of firearms. Um, but it, again, I see it as part of our duty as public safety, <laughs> Uh, people who promote public safety that we need to come up with uh, ways to do this. And um, so, for example, you know, we seize all kinds of evidence in cases, things as large as cars or, you know, that type of thing. And we come up with ways to store um, evidence for um, items that we uh, seize for safekeeping. Um, I do feel that we're tight for storage in various parts of the state for, and I'm speaking for my department alone, we have a accreditation uh, through CALEA and that accreditation requires us to store firearms that are taken for safekeeping in a very different way than other types of evidence, for example. So we're in a situation where we have to find um, a different and separate place to store safekeeping firearms and we manage, but um, we certainly would benefit from a longer term solution, especially in cases where numerous firearms are um, never going to be able to be returned to uh, the defendant and that type of thing. Um, so I just see it as a very separate issue from 
what it seems to me you're trying to achieve with this bill um, and it shouldn't be an obstacle. Um, it's certainly, I think it's a discussion that, that we need to have as a state and figure out how to support the agencies that are struggling with storage. Great, thank you. Yeah, appreciate Hopefully that. I answered your question. Yeah. No, you, you did. You did. Okay. Uh, again, I'm just looking to see if there are any other hands or committee members. Nope. Not seeing anybody. Great. Well, thank you. I really, thank you. Yeah, appreciate your testimony. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. So. Um, we please hear from um, Chief Burke. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see uh, <clears throat> the committee. For those uh, that aren't familiar with me, my name is Sean Burke. I have the, the privilege of serving as the police chief in the city of South Burlington, and I've spent uh, the last 26 years or so in, uh, in policing in Vermont. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify on this bill. I, I represent the uh, Vermont Chiefs and the Vermont Police Associations when I give my testimony today. Uh, this bill we see is one that offers clarity on the issue of firearm surrender when the court has sufficient evidence to order a, re a relinquishment. Uh, Vermont law enforcement are certainly committed to ensuring survivor safety, but there are some resource challenges related to firearm surrender. Each department has vastly different capacities, both in terms of human resources and physical space in order to get this work done. Most municipal police departments prepared fiscal year 22 budgets against the backdrop of the pandemic. The majority of the budgets merely sustain operations and don't allow for investment in firearms storage solutions. Currently, a group of domestic violence stakeholders in Vermont are working on a firearms technical assistance project led by the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. The technical assistant project aims to accomplish a few things to assist the broader system in operationalizing firearm surrender and abuse prevention order service. Specifically, we're trying to develop a standardized protocol for law enforcement service of abuse prevention orders with specific provisions for those cases involving firearm surrender. It's important to note that current law in this bill involves surrender of firearms. There is no broader authority granted to law enforcement to seize firearms. Another objective of the project is to examine firearm storage challenges, both in the near term and the future. As, Ma as Major Jonas has said, survivor safety is of utmost importance. There needs to be a long range plan a short or a more near-term plan that uh, the project is looking at is building a larger network of federal firearms dealers that could be contracted with for short-term storage of any firearms surrendered. This is, system needs to be built out around the state in order for law enforcement to have reasonable access. In general, we support this bill. It, it, again, it uh, codifies the practice that's already in place I think there's a lot of anxiety around the number of instances of when these orders are actually um, issued. I wish there was better data to suggest how many times the court issues um, these orders because I don't feel it's uh, as frequent as some may speculate. Uh, I'm happy to take any, any questions that the committee has. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, just letting folks there we go. Uh, okay, great. So I see Tom and Bob. Thank you. Uh, Chief, you had mentioned uh, possibly uh, as far as storage goes, uh, talking to the uh, licensed de dealers. Do you know if, uh, if that's been attempted at all to talk to licensed dealers about storage of relinqu relinquished guns? So I know in terms of our work on the, on the TA, on the project, that uh, Carolyn Hansen from the AG's office was going to start uh, to look at that communication to see, you know, which FFLs would A, be interested, and then B, who are equipped. I mean, there's a ton of like kitchen table dealers in the state, but the sure. what this requires is an actual brick and mortar uh, storefront with uh, adequate storage facility to keep these firearms safe. Right. Um, just... Just thinking back about you know what I think would be the mindset mindset of federal firearms uh, dealers, 
I'm just going to guess that there's going to be a high percentage that wouldn't even think of storing relinquished guns. But, um, but anyway, uh, thank you. And um, <clears throat> so from what I've heard potentially with this bill, there's, uh, there's the potential that there's going to be more firearms confiscated. And, and the last two witnesses have both talked about inadequate storage that we have. And this certainly isn't the first time that we've talked about ina inadequate storage. And, uh, you know, and I've heard uh, a few times, probably more than a few times through the years now, we need to, and we haven't but we keep passing laws that are going to potentially uh, tax the storage system a little more. Um, and here we are talking about it again. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it, we need to, and, uh, and we need to, to do something about the storage issue. Um, talk is getting us there and um, I don't know uh, if, if, you know, us as the state are going to continue to pass laws that are going, that are going to, or potentially um, increase the number of confiscated uh, firearms, then the state needs to step up and, and, and just do it and, and, and take care of this problem. It's not a potential problem. It's a problem, you know, uh, listening to the last two witnesses. So, um, it, it just doesn't make sense to me on, on that level. I, I certainly appreciate the last two witnesses, you know, and their concern, in, you know, for people's safety. Um, but in, in they were the two issues were kind of separated, but they overlap. You know, the, they at a minimum, they touch each other. And uh, but I see them overlapping because one issue is creating a, uh, a bigger problem in the, the other issue. So I don't know uh, I, I, if it's gonna continue, the, the state of Vermont needs to step up and, and uh, have a centralized or, or you know maybe four different areas in the state that these weapons can be stored. Thank you very much, sir. I, I, I agree and it's weird when you become a police chief, suddenly you have to worry about these things called budgets. Uh, the duty to do this work is clear and compelling. Um, you know, the backside, as you have identified, we, we, need, uh, we need some capacity there, Bill. Oh, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, for, for you folks, it's an unf unfunded mandate mm -hmm. almost. And somehow it needs to be funded, whether it's a state facility or getting money to our, uh, uh, you know, maybe not to all, uh, uh, departments, but enough departments where maybe they could take the firearms from the smaller ones, something like that. But I don't know, it, something needs to be done. We've got a problem that we've been talking about for, uh, well, this is going to be my, oh gosh, uh, a seventh and eighth year on judiciary. And I think we've talked about it every year hmm. and, and nothing's happening. Um, Bob, before I get to you, I just, um, uh, Chief Burke, I was wondering if you could um, help me understand. So um, I don't think I heard you testify that this could result in more um, quote unquote confiscation of, of firearms. Um, curious to know if, if you think um, whether or not it would. I, mean, I think there's a, it's all speculation at this point. Uh, and again, like a question that we raised um, as at the uh, project level was how many of these orders are being issued? And we, we simply don't know. Uh, I will say that, you know, I do police a, an urban environment um, where um, we don't necessarily have um, a number of these orders um, being served here, uh, but that number is, opaque at best, and whether or not a new statute um, will bring heightened awareness and, and additional orders in the future, I don't know. I don't know how it intersects with the number of uh, guns that have been sold as reported in the media. I, I don't know if that prevalence is gonna increase it. I think there's just way too many unknowns to weigh in too deep. Thank you. And in terms of um, storage, do you see that um, related, separate, a reason not to move forward on this bill. Just curious what your thoughts on that, please. I mean, I'm literally of two minds. When an order comes and we've got a dangerous person 
and their intimate partner says that I fear that I'm going to be killed uh, and this person has access to a gun or owns a gun, we need to get that gun and we need to deal with, uh, you know, storage and handling of that downstream of it. Um, you know, how many of those cases will then subsequently result? And then what does that storage look like or need to look like? Yeah, that solution needs an answer. Um, but survivor safety is, is very compelling and the reason why we do this job. So sometimes even I too can be blind to uh, some of the fiscal ramifications of these decisions. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob. Chief Burke, how are you? Good news, sir. I'm doing all right. I was wondering, Chief, uh, under Title 20, uh, BSA 2303, where it states that uh, delivery of an unlawful firearm in possession of an agency which is not going to be used for evidentiary purposes or in a criminal procedure. Have you ever tried to bring a firearm to your local barracks or contact the Department of Public Safety? I probably should have, uh, and I probably should have thought of this when the major, and I see she's still here, so maybe she won't chime in on this also. Has the Department of Public Safety <clears throat> ever told you that you they do not have the capacity or room to take in a firearm? Uh, because by statute, obviously, they're supposed to be doing that because I think both you and I can uh, concur that storage of firearms uh, at any point in time can be of a big uh, concern for law enforcement. Yeah, certainly. I think um, once you understand what the definition of an unlawful firearm is, that's like the first hurdle. And we were able to do that. And we were able to move a, a batch of uh, firearms to uh, buildings and grounds. And that, that was a good process. Um, but if we're talking about guns, whether it's one or 101 that we're going to hold, for 10 days while we wait for an RFA hearing, or then in the days ensuing a final being you know, issued while the uh, defendant figures out what they're gonna be able to do with that gun, because that gun may not be unlawful if it's then you know, legally or lawfully transferred uh, to someone else. So I think that's the fickle part about the statute, uh, you know, the statutory framework in 20 is that unla unlawful guns seamlessly can move to uh, DPS buildings and grounds. These guns that are not yet unlawful, different story. Thank you. So I think <clears throat> you answered the second part of my question, which under the statute, it, constitute, what, it says unlawful firearm. So what constitutes an un un unlawful firearm just due to the fact that a court order says you must take this firearm from uh, somebody's belongings here, what constitutes unlawful? Yeah, and that's one that, you know, we hear municipal government, we pick up the phone and we talk to uh, public safety about what, what that is and we get good guidance. Uh, so, so how many firearms you figure in the course of year you may have to take under these, these court orders? So under uh, family court orders, we've taken very few. I'm going to say less, less than 10 uh, in my time here. And, you know, but how this... <clears throat> would potentially magnify it i don't know that's pure speculation okay and my final question is so out of those 10 that you've probably taken how many are returned that becomes hard um because if there's a family member or uh there's a couple things that complicate this um if there's a family member transferring that uh to a, a lawful you know third party if you will or uh, the other prevailing incident that hems this up all the time is marijuana and drug use that's documented that we know about. And the federal ramifications of putting the, a gun in the, in the hands of a drug user. So uh, I don't know out of that 10, which is a round number, how many we've successfully reunited with, with folks, um, but I do know that there's at least uh, two that rattle around because of uh, marijuana use on the part of either the person that now can have that gun back, you know, if the plaintiff didn't seek a final order and the order is um, has now expired and no longer exists, getting that back, but yet we've got a documented drug history um, with that person, or if the person that they wanted to transfer it to. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Chief. Good seeing you. Good to see you as well, sir. Um, I just wanted uh, to turn to uh, Major Jonas. I didn't know if you wanted to respond to uh, to the question because you were you were referred to. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand it the same way as Chief Burke that there's a pretty clear path forward for unlawful firearms uh, through the BGS auctioning process. So that would be an unlawful firearm um, that is perhaps um, 
rendered in such a way that it makes it illegal or it has no serial number on it, um, other types of things, um, those can be destroyed or auctioned. Um, and that's my understanding of the process. I don't know if I can clarify for Rep Norris further. Okay, thank you. Uh, Felicia. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think this is a question to who it's pertinent, but it might be you, Madam Chair. Um, given the extent of the conversation around storage and the repeated sentiment that if cost were not an issue, I would love to see a fiscal note um, on what it would come out to to have adequate and appropriate storage. Um, and given that there's not a wealth of data on this, um, I would wonder if the courts just have a number, average number of RFAs, and we can multiply that by the month's average number of firearms per person um, to get an approximate firearms that would be turned over in RFAs to get a number for the storage so that we can actually attach a price to what we're talking about. So then we might be able to dive into the other um, more problematic tones of this bill and, and put that behind us. Would that be possible? Well, I think certainly we can ask um, the Commissioner of Public Safety if uh, he has any of those numbers. You can certainly ask the judiciary and however, um, when we have committee discussion, I think we'll determine whether or not, in fact, storage is related to this bill um, or if it, um, in fact, is, uh, is separate. So at this point, we'll hold on. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the chief? Okay, great. So why don't we take our, our break now and then we'll, uh, and we'll come back and continue with our, with our witnesses. Uh, so let's come back at, uh, I'd say 225, please. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, Judge Grierson had uh, came on I don't know if his hand came up, but uh, he came visual. So I wasn't sure if he wanted to make a quick response to that question. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just, uh, again, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, just to follow up Representative Lef Lefter's uh, question or, or comment about storage. I can give you the number of uh, relief from abuse orders that have been granted on a temporary basis. We can also have a number of those that were granted on a final basis, meaning if they weren't granted finally, then they, the firearms would go back. But what the court data does not capture is for every um, temporary order that's issued, it wouldn't capture that specific clause of our firearms ordered, uh, confiscated or relinquished um, and even if it did that, we don't have a record of what was actually turned over. In other words, court may order uh, relinquishment of firearms uh, currently, uh, but we don't track that data. And the information we may have available to us is that some the person has a long gun or a firearm, a handgun, um, but it turns out they may not have both those firearms. So there's just, I'm not aware of any, any entity at this point that tracks um, how many of our orders include provisions for relinquishment of firearms um, or how many are actually confiscated as a result of an order being issued. So before you get to storage, I think those are certainly two gaps in the data that, I, that I'm aware of. Now, maybe there's someone else out there that is tracking that, but it's not the court. I appreciate that, uh, Your Honor. Um, I, my, my line of thought, understanding that we do have real serious gaps in the data um, with which to calculate what I'm asking for, 
I, I would just have to bring my construction mindset with me to this problem is I don't build a closet for the shoes I have. I built a closet for the shoes I might have. I, I don't build something to what it's exact current use would be because it leaves no room for potential or overflow or change. Um, so I think the perfect data isn't needed uh, for this fiscal note that I'm after. It's more what could we be looking at so that we can get a more accurate idea of what we're requesting so that we are not asking our local uh, law enforcement to put another unfunded mandate in their budget and pass it on locally. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Your Honor. And um, thank you, Coach, for, <laughs> for that. Okay. So um, let's take a break and come back at, uh, why don't we come back at 2.30? Thank you.